OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. We just want to um, first introduce ourselves. My name is Maria. I'm from the City College of San Francisco. I'm the chair of my small department. Elisa. Hi, my name is Elisa McCannon. I am a part-time faculty, and I also am the coordinator for our credit recovery program, with this, which is a program that's in partnership with San Francisco Unified School District. Kate. Hi, I'm Kate. Gugatas, and I've been working in transitional studies for over 20 years and love using Canvas in my online and in-person classes. Okay, so we thought uh, in presenting this, we'd give you a little bit a background of who we are, and then we have some faculty testimonials of how they use Canvas. I'm going to include one of my, my favorites, and then Kate will go over quality course design for in-person instruction and Elisa will go over Canvas tools to support for asynchronous instruction. So who are we? We're, we're part of the community college district. Uh, so we're the non-credit division, which means that it prior to city college being free city, it meant that it didn't cost any, it was free. So uh, another way to see us is the adult secondary department, but we also work with ABE and literacy students. 68% of our students are 19 or less, and that includes many of our high school concurrent credit recovery students. 74% of our students are part of the equity group, and the, in the, the speaker today, I really enjoyed her describing equity issues and. Um, and so I'm not going to go over that again, but I, I think that 60% of the 74% are Latinos, then 17% are Asians, and 10.2% are African Americans. And this is according to a 2019-2020 CAEP fact sheet and adult education pipeline. Our program is uh, under Title V of the Community College District, and we have 160 credits. We take credits from their prior high schools, and our classes are, um, our course outlines are follow the guidelines of the Community College District. Each of our courses are 90 hours, and most of the time we meet twice a week, uh, two and a half hours each session. Hold on, sorry. Hey, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> and this is, I just wanted to show a picture of our campus because I'm proud of our campus. It took us 30 years to get that building in place uh, before it was called Colegio de la Misión. It is one of the six satellite campuses, uh, centers of, of the um, City College, and then the Ocean Campus, which is our um, main campus. And just at the bottom, some pictures of our neighborhood. It's very colorful, great place to eat. If you ever want to come, I'll show you where to go. Have some delicious food. So interesting, I noted also this morning, she mentioned distance learning. And so one thing that we thought would be to refresh ourselves, the difference between distance education and online learning. So in distance education, it should be distance learning. Um, it's little teacher interaction and no student-student interaction. It was really literary based. People received things in the mail and then they would be, um, and, you know, re, uh, complete it and then send it back. It was very self-paced with no real structure in terms of like many steps. It was like at the end, you send it in. Versus online learning, which has a strong interaction, uh, teacher, student and student and student interaction. This is one of the things that they hound in us. It incorporates instructional strategies, best practices for student success. It's self-paced, but with scheduled assignments. And this is something our sometimes students get confused. They have modules they have to complete. We have deadlines. And then we use a learning management system, LMS, which for us is Canvas. So how did this start? Because we were traditionally, um, you know, doing in-person classes, uh, using technology to show videos and 
things like of that nature. Um, but like in 2019, we had a, a faculty, an adjunct faculty member who started with us working with our high school students. And she was working at a, a neighboring community college and was an online teacher using Canvas. And she convinced us that Canvas would be a great tool for staff development, for incorporating into our uh, classes, uh, uploading lessons and documents and things like that. So through funding, and this is really important that money is, money is the key to many things from the adult education program, which is uh, funded by the California Department of Ed. We are a consortium of San Francisco Unified School District and City College. We got a funding for our project. And our immediate goal was to get a Canvas support coordinator, which is really crucial to have someone who has the experience and helps other faculty um, get on board. The other thing is that we wanted to put five faculty members each semester to our very rigorous IOTL, which is online teaching and learning training offered by the City College of San Francisco. That is a semester long and we develop yeah, we follow the rubrics and they make sure that we incorporate the best practices of online teaching. Including in that we had to create distance ed addendums of all our course outlines so that it would be part of the CD, CCSF City Online, which is a cohort of online classes, credit and non-credit. Uh, I'm proud to say that we were the first non-credit program to offer online courses. When we do that, we become part of the online learning educational technology department, which consistently gives us training and supports us in our work. So one of our goals is to, um, San Francisco City College was very strict about going back in person. In fact, just this coming semester, we're gonna lift the vaccination mandate that we had uh, for people to register into our programs. And we just went back in person of fall 2022. So we now are offering again in the mornings face-to-face -face instruction. That's what we're cur currently offering 100%. But we are also offering um, what we call online synchronous and asynchronous. We meet 30% on Zoom and then 70% is um, asynchronous. We also offer fully online, which is 100% uh, asynchronous. Our future goal, including the three models that we showed, we wanna have what we call 50% or 30%, depending on the teacher, face-to-face -face instruction, and then the rest of the time, online learning. We feel that the flexibility in any of these schedules for our working adults is really critical. However, we believe that all instructional delivery, including the face-to-face -face instruction, will use Canvas. For now, for example, all syllabus has to be in Canvas. That's one of our, our mandates. And all attendance um, is done through Canvas. So my favorite studio, external tools, Newzella VoiceThread. I'm going to share my screen, my dashboard. So now let me, so I know what I have to do. I have to go here and share my screen. I think I got the deal. So what does it say? Dashboard. Oh, I get it. Right, but you just put yourself on mute at the same time. There, now unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Maria, you're muted. I don't know how you did that. Let me ask you to unmute. Did something pop up? Here, let me see if I can do it. Okay. Now can I share? Yeah, you you are sharing. You are sharing. Okay, okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Thank God I have a sense of humor. Can you see now and hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. So this is my dashboard, you guys. This is my dashboard, and I just wanted to show you the dashboard. And if you can see all these papers over here, this is all my students' works that I have to correct. Oh, joy. I wanted to show Studio, which is right here. And what we do is we create videos in Zoom. That's what I do. Other people do different ways. And then we put it in Studio. And I just want to show you that you can create quizzes, you can annotate it, and you can edit it. And so this is, I really love this feature. I do instructions. I include it in like, if I'm going to have an assignment, how to do it. I put it in my announcements. Sometimes I just put silly, silly stuff. Here's my dashboard again. Um, here's the idea of like using, we call them tiles of training, of support. And then this is my class. I'm actually taking a class and this is my class. I created two assignments in module five, just to show you how embedded material. So in, this is Newzella, something that the grant has also paid. Um, and so education and equality in the United States. So I'm just going to put the edit so you can see that when you, this is an external tool, I find the assignment that I want and then it loads into a new tool. I'm going to save it. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Um, actually, not this one, but Newzella, well, I will. When I open it, it will not be the way the student sees it. And, um, but I just want to show you this, this is also, um, this is what they do. So they're going to write a paragraph. Oh, I, don't can, see, I don't see that. Okay, so let me, let me go back to, uh, hold on, where is it? <clears throat> let me, let and, me share again, let me share again, new share. Okay. And then can you explain what Newzella is? So some people I just asked um, if they're familiar with Newzella and some of our audience is not familiar with what Newzella is. Oh, you're on mute again. How did you do that? What you're on mute again. She, I don't think she realizes that she's on mute. I don't know how she keeps asking. Every time I go on to share, it goes on to unmute. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me go back to share. You're, we can see your screen. Well, I can't see my screen. Can you see this? We okay. see the assignment education and equality in the okay. United so, States. Okay, so basically, I, Newzella is a depository. I'm going to go back to this one. It's a depository of articles, news articles, current articles that are um, available to us. We download them. We can change the reading level. It has tools like annotation. Um, they can, what is it called? Um, immersive reader. And we can, they can write a paragraph. They can do multiple choice questions and it goes the way it works with us because we have it embedded in our system. It can go right to the speed grader, which we will talk about and we can grade them right there and it goes towards their, um, their grade. Okay, so I'm gonna show one more thing. And it is something that City College has paid for. It's an external tool, so it's an additional. I think during the pandemic, Many, I know I have um, school age kids, they were using it. So I think during the pandemic, Newzella was made available to many school districts. But now that we're kind of post pandemic, it is, I think, something that uh, the district would have to pay for. Okay. And now this one, can you see this one? This Patricia? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is another tool that I really, really enjoy. And um, it is a voice thread. And this is a way that student to student participation. So if I click on here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And, so you, can, can, see, and you can see me. <laughs> so I, I think what's happened, did it load it in a new window for you? Because all we're seeing is canvas. We're not actually seeing the yeah. external. It open. opens a new okay. window. And so, every time I go to the new window. So you have to just share your desktop. I am sharing my desktop. 
And as soon as I do that, it goes into, um, what do you call it? And you're muted again. What What is going on with your Zoom? <laughs> and then I, I'm done with this. I'm just kidding. So uh, this, I, I like our, our, our speaker, discipline, keep at it. Okay. So this is voice thread. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to, um, I'm gonna have to go back and then go back because VoiceThread. So VoiceThread is another external tool that we act, that we can use. And what we do with VoiceThread is, I'm going to open it. Can you still see? No. Okay, can you see it now? Unmute me. Mm -mm. Unmute me. You are unmuted. Okay, so now can you see? I'm gonna sh new share. Okay. Um, share. But we can't remember. Unmute yourself. So can there, you're you're good. We can hear you. Okay, can you hear me here? So basically. It's students will read these things and then they can audio, they can do a written, they can, and then do an audio and they can actually take a picture. My students want like the video and they are going to relate how this, this passage, this relates to Patricia and who Patricia is. And then students are, are will also be audio responding to another student. Those are my favorites. Now okay. we're going to, now I'm going to stop sharing. So during what we can do is we can maybe um, provide some links of uh, voice uh, voice thread in Newzella, um, and you guys can learn more about it. But they're great ways to provide um, students with a variety of um, assessment tools to assess their learning. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna share the PowerPoint presentation. And what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna just show a quick video of some of our faculty and what they have to say. And you know what, before I do that, I'm gonna make sure that I'm sharing my entire desktop. Um, and can you hear me? Yes, I am not unmuted. Okay, so here we go. Let's. Uh, play this hopefully I was having some issues with ah okay what's going on why won't it play all right I'm going to pause share and I'm going to find the video a different way because it's not working even though it's embedded in here okay well let me see the chat while you do that you are muted that's right Rhonda, I'm having a really fun time <laughs> <laughs> because I would didn't keep, I wasn't able to get in, and so I went another way. And I'm not really in my Zoom meeting. I'm on the I'm on your the Zoom meeting through the web. That is it. Now, I'm learning something new today. Okay, so give me a second. I've got this meeting. I'm going to uh, new share. I'm going to share this. All right. Hopefully. Let me make yep. sure you guys share my audio, optimize, and let's hear it. Uh, hello, my name is Julita McNichol. I teach math and science, and I use Canvas in both of my classes, in person and online. I believe that Canvas is a great tool. You can make easy and fast changes in your assignments or course content and reach all your students at the same time. My favorite tool is the announcements. I do a weekly announcement, including a walkthrough video for the week and any other important information for the week. I know that all my students can see it and go over that information even if they don't talk to me.
A feature I like to use in Canvas is the popover. Let me show you how that works. First go to edit and then choose the, you'll have the design tools, choose that stack of boxes, click on that, scroll down for pop-up content and let me show you how that works. Let's say I want to define this word, I will go to popover after I clicked on it and I will make a definition here. Another thing you can do, you can also delete it right there. If I want to do an image, I'll click on the um, word, click popover and paste the image. You can also insert the image from the toolbar at the top. Let me hit save and then I can show you what it looks like. So the student is reading, they want to know the definition. You can see the little box, the definition's there. And if you need the definition to be a picture, you can do it right there. The immersive reader has also been helpful for my students. At the top, click immersive reader. You can choose the text size, this font, the color, and if you go to grammar options, it can highlight if you want, the student wants to look at nouns, verbs, adjectives to really hone in on their language skills, syllables to really spell things out. But I'm gonna skip that for now. I'm gonna to go to the book, which is reading preferences. After students read the text in English, I encourage them to read it in their language to see if they understood correctly. It's gonna be a little extra work for them, but it reinforces what they've read. So there's a lot of languages to choose from, as you can see. I'm gonna choose that one, and I'm gonna turn it on to the document. So it translates the entire document, and Jimmy Home Page. And the students can listen to it while they are doing dishes or something like that. Hi, I'm Sandra, Transitional Studies, City College of San Francisco. One of my favorite features in Canvas are the discussions, and I use the discussions to foster collaborative work among my students. Um, in order to get the student buy-in, you really need to grade your discussions, uh, value them equally with any other work you do, or like me, um, you could make discussions the majority of the student work, which is what I do in both my U.S. history, um, high school U.S. history and literature and composition classes. And um, so I use this to have students working together, working in community, building uh, their knowledge together. And so I'll just show you a couple very quick examples. Um, in my U.S. history class, the students refer to the chapter reviews to come up with questions and then they explain why the questions are important to them and respond to each other's questions. Um, in my literature and composition class, um, one thing I can do, we're working on literary devices in this particular uh, module and so I might say, you know, find a literary device in the, the song that we used and then um, have students uh, post that and then they can comment on each other's uh, work. And last but not least, one of my favorites is a midterm project that I did for U.S. History where students um, come up with a guiding question and then use um, sources, primary sources, and do some research, secondary sources to answer their question and share with other students so that we can build, um, we can build uh, a collaborative knowledge regarding the historical period we're studying. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, I am going to do um, a new share and I'm going to present again. Um, any, you know, I hope that was a helpful video. I could also put it in the chat, a link to it, and you can watch it over again if you'd like. Um, but now what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Kate um, and she's going to walk you through um, how she's using Canvas today. And, you know, really she's back in person. And so how does that support, how does she support her student success using Canvas? So I'm going to stop sharing, Kate, and you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Elisa. And let me know, you know, if I forget to unmute, if there's any issues there. I will. Are we good for time? Do I still have 25 minutes if I need it? Yeah, I can go over my stuff pretty quickly. Okay, well, I'll try to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my timer here, give myself a little warning. Okay, well, hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. So, whoops. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to see, I wrote up a little agenda. And the first thing I'm going to do is make a copy of it. And I'm going to paste it in the chat because it does have some links that you might want to access. So there's the agenda. You want to have that for later. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, could you make it, could you also make it bigger on your screen, please? That dot. Um, hmm. So you have that 100% on the left-hand side there. Do you see the 100? You can change the percentage to something bigger than that. Maybe 150? Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, how, okay, there's 150. Sure, yeah. that's great. Thank you, okay. Kate. All right, yeah, no, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be talking about face-to-face -face classes and using Canvas. And the thing is that um, for me, I teach both online and kind of um, blended and fully face-to-face. -face. And my Canvas courses look very similar in all three of those examples. Uh, the only difference is you, well, I'll talk about some of the differences, but when you really look at my course, it looks very similar to an online course because all of the material I'm using is on Canvas. No handouts, no books, nothing. Everything is on Canvas and students bring their computers to class and they open them up. Um, City College provides laptops and Chromebooks for students who don't have them. Um, and students are just have gotten used to bringing their computers to class and opening up and I project and we all get to work with Canvas. So I'm going to be in this presentation, I'm going to be drawing on what's called the CVC OEI rubric. And this rubric is really, um, it can it's kind of the gold standard for online education in the state of California. Uh, both in terms of best practices, but also in compliance with the law for accessibility issues. Um, and there's four areas of the rubric. They are content presentation, interaction slash collaboration, assessment, and accessibility. And there is a fifth content, there's a, sorry, there's a fifth section that has been developed by Peralta Community College on equity, uh, but that has yet to be officially adopted into the rubric, but it is has been developed by Peralta. So um, just in terms of these four areas of this rubric, which is a long rubric, um, you know, what have we seen today? Julita talked about announcements. That would kind of fall under interaction. I'm not going to talk about that today. Maria talked about voice thread and um, quizzes in Nuzella. And Sandra talked about discussions. All of that would be more in the assessment area. Assessment doesn't necessarily mean a test. It can be anything that's formative or summative assessment practice. Um, and then accessibility is, is its own area that I'm not going to get into. I'm going to talk about content presentation. And I, I, I chose, there are 14 areas in this rubric. Oh, and I just also wanted to mention that um, this rubric that I'm drawing on is a collaborative effort among California community colleges to ensure that significantly more students are able to complete their educational goals by increasing both access to and success in high quality online courses. And they've, in creating this rubric, they have drawn on the existing work of 
an organization called At One, which is a fabulous organization. I put a link to it down here. That stands for the Online Network of Educators. If you go to their website, you will see that they have um, many resources, videos, and courses you can take in staff development. I highly recommend looking into At One. So they, the, in creating this rubric, the work of At One was drawn on, as well as the work of the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges and the California, California Community College Chancellor's Office. Okay, so I'm only talking about three tools from section A and sorry, three sections from section A. And there's 14, there's 14 elements I should say in section A, which is about content presentation. I'm gonna talk about three. I'll talk about A7, effective use of course management system tools for ease of learning. Um, and those tools I'm going to be talking about are modules and Canvas pages. And then I'll talk about page level chunking and multimedia. And that's going to go much um, quicker. I'm going to spend the most time on modules and Canvas pages. OK, so and I also just want to say there's another element in the rubric uh, it's called unit level chunking. So when we talk about modules, we're talking about chunking material into manageable units of learning. So this is the homepage of my course, and I'll talk about pages in a minute. But over here on the side, I can click on modules. And currently, I have um, <clears throat> six modules in my course and an extra credit module, which doesn't have a number. And you can see that all of these have been published except six. So we, I haven't opened six yet. Um, and then at midterm time, which is coming up in the middle of March, these modules will lock. Students have had the whole semester to work on them. That's about you know, eight weeks by now. And um, I will open up a new set of modules, which you won't, you can't see here yet. So the nice thing about this page, um, this module is also not published. That's just for me. You can um, expand them and, you know, then you can kind of see everything that is in every module. And that can get to be overwhelming. So I remind students just collapse your modules if you kind of want to get an overview of, you know, what we've been doing the whole semester. Um, OK, so let's talk about how I might want to add a module. I just click on add a module and um, I'm going to, I could give the module a name. Um, so I might call this the OTAN um, presentation module. That's not what I would call it for my course, but anyway, um, I can I can give it a name uh, and I can, I can lock it until a certain date. So that's really nice. I can, and can I can work on it and, and have it just be a work in progress and students aren't going to have any access to it until it opens up. I can also add a prerequisite. I could require it that students have to complete other modules before they complete this module. Probably not a great idea in our courses because if your students, if your programs are like ours, you're probably somewhat open entry. And I like to maybe have students, I tell them, um, you know, go back and complete one assignment from the orientation that's really important, like the student intake sheet. And then I want you just to jump in where we are. I don't want to burden a student with doing a whole bunch of makeup work um, before they jump into where we are. Okay, so that's how you add a module. Um, expanding, collapsing, I've gone over the lock until requirements. So, um, Let's take the module zero. If I go to edit, the requirements, I can set various requirements for each page or assignment in the module. I can either have students view the item, mark as done, or um, so view and mark as done are the only options I'm going to have for a content page. And I'll talk more about that. If it's an assignment, they could submit the assignment or they could contribute. Um, so I can add those requirements. And then when I do, what it looks like to a student is they see, uh, oh, I have to view this page and I have to view all these pages and I have to contribute. So if I go to student view, which is probably more useful for these requirements, and a student is looking at this module, 
Um, well, this test student that it opens up in has not completed these requirements yet. So when I set these requirements, it's a way for students to get a, to look at which pages they've actually viewed that could help them to not get as lost. Um, and then occasionally it, I might require them to mark it as done, which for a variety of reasons that might be better than just viewing and we'll talk about that later. So that's what the requirements are for. It's really for the, for the students to see what they've completed and what they haven't. Okay, um, so text headers, another feature of, of modules. And again, modules are a tool. That's why it falls under A7, effective use of, can of course management system tools. Um, if, you're, if you're organizing your material um, into modules, that makes it accessible to students and it creates a system of predictability for them. The predictability in my module system is always that they're going to have an overview page at the top. I explained that's kind of like a table of contents and they're going to have a summary page at the bottom. In all honesty, these are the pages that students view the least, but I do like to have them there. Um, it's kind of where I put things. Um, I might put extra resources down in the summary page. And I'm going to put uh, a link to our agenda for the day in the overview page. Um, but text headers. So a text header is um, something you can add into the module here. And you would go to text header. And what that, you, I make one that says content pages. And I make one that says assignments. And so students know that they should read content pages before they jump into their assignments. Um, they don't always do it, but um, that's the idea. This is your learning material, your, your, your textbook, your videos, your graphics that we're gonna use when we begin our assignments. Um, the numbering system. This helps students not only to follow in order, so this is module 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but when a student has a question, they can refer to, I didn't understand you know, the question you asked me in assignment 0 0.5. It's for them, to easy reference for both them and me in that numbering system. And then finally, um, if I have put my assignments and my content pages into a module, um, that creates what's called the next and previous button, which if you just have random pages, you know, which you could do uh, that aren't in a module, you won't have the next button. So students can, it's, it's a feature of the module tool that students are able to flip through pages um, and then also go back to pages. Okay. So that's um, modules. Now, as I was saying, it's really important to have a consistency of structure in your module. Um, and that brings me to the next um, tool, which is Canvas Pages. So in, just go back, I'm not using my tabs the way I had intended to, isn't that the way it always happens? Okay, so, um, the consistency of structure, as I, I already went over that, it has to do with my text headers and my overview and my summary pages. Now, let's say that I want to add a page into a module. Okay, so I was going to give the, it was going to use module six because I don't want to be adding pages into modules that students are currently looking at. This is actually a live course. Um, okay, so in a couple of weeks, we'll be doing slavery in the US Constitution. This is a US history, early US history course. So if I wanna add a page, um, and let me just say a Canvas page is an amazing tool, okay? Um, you are a web designer, okay? And I'll show you how that enables it to happen. So I could just add a page, and I, I can um, either create a new page or I can draw on, you know, one of my existing pages. Here's all the pages that I've created for this course. Um, so if I just go, oops, if I just go to 
create a page and I'm going to call this like um, OTAN page. Okay. And I can indent it, you know, um, cause that has to do with my outline structure, which is another important consistency you want to go to, to try to incorporate into your modules. And I add it, you know, it's going to pop, it's going to show up down at the bottom here. Of course I can drag it and I put it where I want. I can also move it using the move um, thing. But if I open up that page, it, it's literally a, a blank page, <laughs> okay? And I have to just start adding. So that can be a little bit intimidating to a new user. And so um, what City College has done instead is um, given us, whoops, let's go back to my modules. City College has provided us with, I'm gonna add, and I'm gonna do page again. But instead of just creating a totally blank page on my own, um, I'm gonna get a sample content page. And you can get these from the Canvas Commons. And that looks, a little less intimidating. It's not a totally blank slate for you to start creating, but it does notice that um, City College um, web designers have given us, well, why don't you at least have a couple of headings um, to chunk your material? And we like it if you might, it's just good practices you know, to not just give students reading, but tell them like, what do you want them to look for when they're reading this? What might be their focus for reading? And so that um, that's what I use when I'm creating a new page. I usually start with this. Um, if I wanted to edit this, this is called my rich content editor up here. And um, I could, you know, create a link on either an external link or I can link to another page in Canvas. I can link to an assignment. Um, I can link to, um, usually it's gonna be an assignment or another page. So um, you can upload an image. You can link to Canvas Studio, which Maria showed us might be your, your bank of, um, uh, recordings that you've made. There's so many things that you can do with this content page. Um, and then finally, so I've kind of shown you a very a blank Canvas page. I've shown you a template to begin um, chunking your material and creating your own web page, your own um, web page of material. And then a more complicated page is your home page. This is actually a page that um, someone who's more advanced than I am at City College created. And your home page is really important because it's where students land. And so a quality home page is going to help students access information. It's going to give them your contact information. It's going to give them links to resources. Um, that is in the Canvas student support, but you could link um, to DSPS. You could link to tutoring. Um, there's a Q&A discussion that's open all semester for students here. And you also, on a homepage, you want to give them um, a place to start. Students want to know that if they click start here, that's going to drop them into whatever module we're working on that week. So that's <laughs> a, this is also, yeah. Could you show us a content page in your actual module? Yeah. What yeah. it looks like, just like a completed one? So a completed content page in the module would look like, um, let's go here. So I usually, and this is getting back to that predictability of structure, I usually start off with some films to get them into the material. So you'll notice that structure that I showed you as you watch the first video, listen for this. As you watch the second video, listen for this. So mm -hmm. here's, um, those are the headings. And then he, I embedded three films. They're all um, short, you know, five minutes or less. That's one content page. 
The next content page is um, a slideshow uh, of Native Californians and the Portal Expedition. And so when you're just a question, so when you're actually teaching in person, you're pulling this up and projecting the videos mm -hmm. for your students and watching it together. Um, yeah. Right. So um, it's it's not it's it's just, again, an, a, a way to organize information for your students. And then it's helpful, right, because if a student is absent, they can come back to this canvas and then review the information that they may have missed in class. Absolutely. Right. That's right. So, um, but as I said, it's um, it's organized just like an online class would be, mm -hmm. except that we're going through it together. Together, right. We're going through it together. And another difference between online instruction and in person is, I would say the material, like I said, it's organized very similarly, and the and they still submit they still submit information through Canvas. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to be as intentional about my communication about what they're supposed to do every week. I don't have to record videos of myself telling them what to do every week because I'm there with them in person. So right. there's less work in that way. Okay, I was going to show you the syllabus, which is another Canvas page, but another time I'm going to move on. We've really talked about, because um, I only have five minutes left, so we've talked about all of these things. Page level chunking, I've demonstrated that for you. Um, you need to make sure that your content is chunked and you're using heading styles that facilitate online reading. That is, a, that's a content page that's in alignment, meets that standard, but an exemplary content page would use heading styles that actually are meaningful. So you don't want to say section one, section two, you want to say, um, you know, um, films about the portal expedition, you know, background information, tell them what, what it is. Um, and then, a7 and A8 are very related. There's um, you want to make sure you have a variety of media to address different learning styles, text, audio, video, images. The, the Canvas pages allow you to do all this. Um, but I'll quickly introduce you to Helen Graves, who is another name you might know. We all learn through different preferred modalities, visual, auditory. We all learn through different preferred modalities, visual, auditory, text-based, et cetera. This instructor has done a great job of providing students with a variety of ways to get the information they need for this unit. There's textbook links. There are other links to videos and cell games and tutorials. There's a number of videos separated by category. She's even included a just for fun section for students that want a little more. So that's a Canvas page that, that was being highlighted there. Um, okay. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is attendance features in Canvas. Uh, <laughs> we were using what are called PARs up until the pandemic and um, positive attendance records. And they were such dinosaurs. They were like from the year 1960. And they had like, you know, mim they had copies and they got like, you got like ink all over your hands and you had to rip them off and use a number two pencil. And um, it was so antiquated. And, and, and this is one of the wonderful things about Canvas is we can now take attendance using a tool called Attendance Plus. So there's two, I have two attendance features enabled here, Attendance Plus and regular attendance. Attendance Plus is actually, okay, so there's maybe some FERPA issues here. I shouldn't be showing these students' names, but um, there we go. I can, um, I can mark my attendance right here uh, in Canvas and the college receives it and that's how we get our funding. And then, um, I can also take attendance much more informally. I do this in my online classes. Um, for example, sorry, I do it in my blended classes where we, the class is online, but certain students are attend are required to attend Zoom sessions every week because they are part of the San Francisco Unified School District. And we decided with the school district that they need to attend Zoom sessions. And so here's another FERPA issue. Um, I'm just gonna go away from that page, but that's a much um, less, um, it's not reported to anybody. It's just for me to mark um, who attended the Zoom session so that I can know. 
Great. So thank you so much, Kate. That was a lot of wonderful information. I have another question because I know Sandra talked about discussions, right? And how she's using that really on her asynchronous class. And since you're, you know, I know discussions as a in in-person instructor, right? Those are really valuable um, ways for students to interact, but I see that you have a discussion still in Canvas. So can you address how um, you work that into your in-person class? Oh, the discussion, right. Okay, so um, yeah, should I, I, should I share my screen again? Or should we just share your screen? Yes, that is kind of like, that was like a quandary for me, I have to say. And I think I even talked to Maria about it. Um, it's like, wait a minute, you know, cause discussions, like you said, it's one of the primary ways in an online class that is interaction, that that's substantive effective interaction is largely through the discussion. So when you're in person, do you use the discussion tool? I asked Maria and she was like, you know, maybe. And then I even asked my daughter uh, who, who was a high school student at the time and, and was using Canvas at her high school. Are you using discussions? And she was like, we do use some discussions sometimes in in-person classes. Mm -hmm. And then I even asked students, I made a survey. Well, what did you like? What did you didn't? And one student said, I don't understand why we're doing discussions in, a, in an in-person class. And one student said, I really liked the discussions in the in-person class. So go figure, right? I mean, people, people are people and they like different things. So I've kind of settled on, I definitely don't have a discussion as regularly as I would in an online class. Um, I'll have it maybe once every three weeks. We'll have a discussion. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And it's building on a discussion that we've had in class. Yeah. They can go deeper. Sometimes students need more time to think. And a small group in an in-person class can give them that first touch of like, what might I think about this issue? And then they can go home and think about it deeper and post to the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna take some time um, to share my screen and a couple of things. I'm also gonna kind of go back. Um, I gotta close a lot of stuff here. So I wanna make sure that I have everything that I need to have open so that I can have a true, a smooth here transition. So um, I'm kind of primarily focusing on using Canvas on a strictly asynchronous um format where students are really just no Zoom going on. Um, however, I will say that I am one of the instructors that does that hybrid model where I meet with my students about 30% of the time and then they're doing work asynchronously self-paced. Um, but I'm going to share a couple features kind of tying back to that rubric. Um, some of the things that Kate had mentioned, right, that assessment piece, the formative and um, summative assessments and really allowing students to practice, right, that formative assessment is giving them opportunities for growth, revision, maybe not necessarily like maybe not having, you know, having maybe practice quizzes or things that are not going to really impact their grade, but it's a learning tool so that they can kind of assess where they're, you know, where they're at in their learning. A lot of times we learn from making mistakes. And so that's really like, oh, I got that wrong. Okay, so let me go back. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things. Quizzes, I'll bring up very quickly and show the different options that we have available in Canvas's quizzes. I'm also going to talk and show, or I'm going to show you an example of something that's available called Quick Checks. And this Quick Checks allows like these to allows you to integrate these again low stake assessments, um, and it can actually be plopped in right into your content page. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Make sure that I'm um, I'm going to just share my Chrome. And can you all see that? And am I not? I am not on mute. And hold on, what happened? Student view. Okay, here we go. So here's a quiz. Um, this is just, I brought up, right, a quiz of, as if I were going to, um, well, actually, let me go to a quiz that I already have um, so that you can see it here. We, we do have, as 
Kate mentioned, we do have templates available. Um, City College has made it, so it's very easy. We can kind of copy and paste it in the template. And this is what it looks like from a student. We have like our instructions. We have information on submission, right? How they should be submitting and helpful resources, you know, how to take a quiz. We'll link them to a Canvas student guide that provides them information. This is a graded quiz. So they're going to get, you know, a point for each um, question that they get correctly. And this is, again, very simple quiz. They can answer it. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you a couple of the different settings that are available. So if you wanted to provide a student, you can provide them with a graded quiz. Um, this will, again, give them uh, some points and it will go towards um, a certain person, you know, towards their final grade. You can also, I think with quizzes, maybe not quizzes. Um, well, then the other one would be a practice quiz. So this practice quiz gives them that practice without um, without going towards their final grade um, and impacting their grade. So again, that's a way to give our students that opportunity to assess their learning that formative assessment, how are they doing, and then maybe learn again from from um, what they're what miss you know what things they're missing out right. Um, and then another great tool about the quizzes is as um, you can edit your when you're creating your questions, you can just select okay this is the right answer, but let's say they do select the wrong answer, you can provide some uh, mass, uh, some feedback that will be given to the student right away. And that targeted feedback is really important in the learning process, especially in asynchronous learning. They're on their own. We're not in person. We're not next to them to kind of guide them or give them that feed, real-time feedback. So I can say, not quite, um, go back to the syllabus. I can spell right under communication plan to see how I can reach, you know, how I can be reached or something like that, right? So I'm giving them, I'm letting them know, nope, that's not the right answer. And then I'm also telling them where to go to find the right answer. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to leave that there because that's, you know, it's really good. So comment. So this is what they'll see. Um, I'm going to save that. <clears throat> so that's just kind of, a, those are kind of quizzes. Um, another form of knowledge check or quick checks that you can include in your courses. This is a page, right? So, um, Kate did a great job kind of showing us a page. I have a video here, right? And so we're watching this video. And um, then underneath, they have to answer these questions. And these quick checks, I'll show you how to add them and where they can be added, how to, um, what the different settings are. So in this particular ch quick check, I'm going to just point you to the bottom right of my page. You can see here that I've got an exclamation mark and it's telling the student, because I'm in a student view, answer quick checks to proceed. So they cannot continue on to the next page until they answer these questions. And so let's say I'm gonna say true. Again, I provide them, yep, that's right. Or if they click false, I will say, you know, nope, historical. So they're, again, they're learning. Um, you know, here again, if they click the right answer, it'll, it'll, it can tell them. Um, and again, giving that immediate feedback is really an important part of um, making sure our students are getting the information that they need to be successful, right, to learn. So now I'm going to answer all of these, and I'm not answering them right, so it's not letting me proceed. So I have to keep trying until I get this right. And so this is a way, again, to make sure that your students are really getting what you're trying them, you know, what you want them to get out of this particular content. So now I've got them right and I can move on to the next page. 
Um, quick checks, and I'm going to show this. This is a, a class that I took as a student that had quick checks. And so you can also make them optional. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this particular example here, you can see that I have the next button available. So I'm not required to answer this question, but it's an optional way for me as a student to assess if I'm understanding the content that has been presented on this page. So I'm gonna leave student view and I'm gonna just quickly demonstrate <clears throat> how I, I added this to my page. Um, here on the top, these are called design tools and this is an advanced feature so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up my advanced uh, elements. And you'll see here, we saw that um, Melissa demonstrated the pop-up feature, which I think is an amazing feature of using the tools correctly, especially for our students that are ESL students. Um, where is my quick check? So here's my quick check. So I can scroll to the bottom of my page where I want to add my quick check. And let me just do it. Um, I'm just going to add it as a block. So now it's added it here for me, and I can type my question here. I can, if I can type, and then my answer A, again, A, right? Um, and then I can put whatever feedback I want here. Oh, see, you always have to be careful. I'm going to edit and do that. Sometimes it's just easier, you gotta delete because when you select, sometimes it deletes too much, right? So I'm just gonna say response to text, my answer B, response to text, okay? And here I need to select which one is correct. So I'm gonna say that B is correct. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that and that lets me know that this is the correct answer. Now I'm going to delete this because this is a live class. I'm going to cancel that and I don't want to save that because my students are currently in this module doing that. But again, this is an easy way for students to assess their learning um, and really kind of forces them without impacting their grade. I don't have the chat up, but I'm just going to stop. I think we've only got one participant left. <laughs> Do any questions on this before I move over to the next thing I wanted to share? I'll be checking the chat. Thank you, Maria. Okay. Another use of um, that I've really found um, works really well with our students is it's called it's called annotated text, especially for sometimes in English class. I want them to read something and then I want to see them annotate. I want to see them highlight. I want to see their notes. Um, I want to see them underline keywords, things like that. So here's an example of um, this here. I actually have them write this. I have them watch this video. And while they're watching this video, why can't I see it as a student? Oh, because I've already done it as a student. So I have to do new attempt. Um, as it has this worksheet. So I'm gonna zoom in this worksheet and they basically, they have their tools up here. They can highlight, they can take this little tool and they might underline or they can answer the question, right? Um. And then once they're done, I will actually show you what this looks like. They can also download it so that they have it. Oh, how do I undo it? Here, right, they've made their annotations. They've answered the question. They've watched the video. Now they're going to submit the assignment. And the way that it comes to me, I'll leave and I'm going to use just the test student here. Um, speed grader, I'm going to go over. So I, this is actually good. I can kind of go into speed grader. 
this is how I can, um, and I'm gonna, so I wanna go all the way to the test cause I don't, again, FERPA. Um, so here's my test student, this was me. I can see everything that the student has submitted. I can go in as an instructor and I might say, hmm, you know, great job at, you know, defining this. However, um, you, you know, take a look at something, right? At module 1.3 for further clarification, okay? Again, it's a way for me to give them that feedback right away. I can give it to them right in the document. I usually use comments though, because it takes it right to where, it points them right to where I wanna put a comment to there. I can also add comments here in the submissions. I usually say something like, um, uh, you know, if, if it's a, some, a document like this, I may say, see my comments in the document uh, or something like that. And then the rubric here allows me to give them points. Maybe they only got two points here, but they got all the 16 points here and they got the six point or five points here. It saves it and then it automatically scores the assignment for them. So that's speed grader. Elisa, I want to also add that you can, um, I often record yes. video at the bottom so that if they, I explain to them, uh, you can you can send an attachment. You can have a media comment, and I do that sometimes, explaining them what's going on, and then you can reassign. That's if right. They're not, they're not doing um, if they need some more practice. Yes, you can reassign it to them. Um, an attachment. Sometimes what I've done is I've actually attached the doc, like maybe a resource document that I think they need to refer back to. Um, so these, again, this is really an important part of asynchronous learning because we're not next to them um, to kind of assess that and provide that real-time feedback to them in the classroom. Um, what other, okay, so anything else, Kate or Maria, you'd like to kind of no. talk about with speed grader or gradebook? Uh, well, I love it. Yeah. I, I also, it it um it communicates with the students their grades. Yes. The yes. students um, look at their own grades. So and see what's missing. Yes. So so I'm actually going to kind of show that. So this is a grade book. This is actually not FERPA because this is a credit read. This was like a faculty, uh, pr professional development type of class that we did. Um, for our arts teachers when they um, teach credit recovery with our SFUSD students. So these are just instructors. We had them go through this class in Canvas to kind of understand. And so here's gradebook. And so you can see here, like I've scored everything. And so this person got, you know, these are knowledge checks, those are probably quizzes, but you know, let's say it was something you could see the score. One great tool too, especially for me, I have a lot of students that are either high school students taking these courses congruently to get credits, or they're um, aged out like 19, 20, 21. And a lot of my students need a lot of nudging, a lot of, okay, where, you know, um, it's, it's a lot of, it can be a lot of babysitting. <laughs> and so a great tool here is that you can message students who have not submitted their work. And so it'll tell me exactly who those students are. So I can see, oh, this guy yet again did not do this work, right? And that, but that that gives me, right? I can kind of see some trends. Um, but then I can send a message, you know, um, hey, uh, students, I see this assignment, you know, hasn't been turned in. You know, I may say something like, you know, is there something I can help you with? Do you, you know, let's meet, you know, something like that to give them that nudge and that will go into their Canvas inbox. That's a great tool. Um, from a student's perspective, um, I'm going to go here because I'm going to show you um, it from a student's perspective, you can go into grades. And it'll show you kind of your, you know, from a student's perspective, it shows their grade. It'll tell them if they have something missing. It'll give them their score. And then they can also see the feedback that was given, um, you know, 
maybe how they were scored. So it also gives them that information. And it's really important that this information is provided to the students. I go over this several times um, when I meet with my students on Zoom, but you can also make something available to them where they can, and I think I added it here. Um, oh, maybe I didn't. Um, but there is a way that there's, you should basically have it so that they understand. I have a video that I've created that walks them through how to get their grades, how to look at feedback that's been provided um, and all of that. And I make that uh, available to students um, so that they have, um, they, they can know when I'm giving that feedback, where to get that feedback. Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I um, actually, I, I closed the presentation, but I think we're at the end. <laughs> I think we are. Question and answers from the from anyone? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. I thank you, Elisa, that was very informative. And Kate, um, you, any questions from our OTAN staff? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I appreciated that. Um, oh gosh, now I can't remember what it's called, but where you put the the I, the information um, linked to a word or phrase on the on the page. Oh, That's the popover. The popover. The popover. Really and cool. I actually, I, I knew about the popover, but I didn't know about the image. So I also learned something new in this process. And so that was really cool because you could also, like, if you're trying to describe something, you know, you can pull up an image. And that's the thing about um, using Canvas. And we do get a lot of support. There's so many ways you can interact with the student that it's just like, you think you know it all. And then you go, oh, wow, I can do that. Um, and it's it's uh, learning, it's constantly learning, constant, in, uh, like I think going, like with our, our speaker in the morning said, right? It's just changing and um, getting with it. It's really important. Any other comments? I think we have someone from CDE, Rhonda. Is that California? Hello, hello. Hi, is this from California Department of Ed? Thank you for the funding. <laughs> yes, I work, I'm the fiscal manager in our adult ed office. Um, I have two interests in Canvas today. One is because Anthony and I started last year putting on one of our training sessions in Canvas. So I was curious kind of some of the options, but also I have a DSPS college student and I'm trying to supervise and assist her with learning and it's not my expertise, but trying to guide the student knowing where to look and and different things so seeing it firsthand is really helpful mm -hmm. um and trying to think of uh, kind of the um you were talking about the different modalities yeah. and just the needs each individual student has um and seeing how to apply it because it's just a challenge learning it firsthand but also teaching it to someone else so thank you for all your sharing and your insights today and uh, one thing that we also do is we can add people into our Canvas shells. So we have people from our DS, uh, our disabled students um, uh, placement services that help, they, they're in the Canvas shell so that they can see what the students are doing for our students that have those issues. We have counselors sometimes. Um, we, we, we're working on getting embedded tutors in there. So that's another thing that is um, a good tool to be able to have. I will say I, I can see now from the teacher's perspective how much work it is to create this and set it up. My student has a sewing class and I've been looking at the modules because last semester was all electronic and right. at home, but this semester was in person and just seeing the nuances and the changes. And I would agree with something, I think it was Elisa that said earlier about when you're in person, um, finding that hybrid time to provide the resources to use it out of class, but to talk when you're in person that 30% of the time 
to connect and have just those options available, especially for, and in our case, our adult learners are more English language learners or, or whatnot, but hearing and repeating it multiple times, that's critical for some of our students. Yeah, we find that having the Zoom meetings because we were um, now th that has made a big difference also, even if like uh, it's really mandatory for our high school young people, but our adults are coming. But we really do want to work on the, that high, that model where they come in person so that they learn how to use the tools, be comfortable with the the um, maneuverings and everything, how to download, how to like. Um, yeah all that stuff really needs hands-on and then they can transfer transition eventually into a fully online class when when they're more proficient so it'll be interesting to see how we can use canvas for our administrators and using these training classes um it, we love the in-person or the online but you need those resources throughout the year so i'm encouraged to see how as administrators at cde we can make this work for for all of you teaching our students. Thank you. So, so Kate and I just actually completed a course, professional development course, uh, using Canvas. Uh, was it six weeks? Six weeks. So, I mean, that OTAN, I definitely recommend, um, you know, kind of peeking around in there. They have a lot of great resources, but they hosted it and we just completed it. So, they're doing it. I mean, they're doing it for teachers. Who's they, Lisa? Who was th that? Was sponsored by? Wasn't it sponsored by um, OTAN? No, CBE. Oh, I no, think. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Not OTAN. Um, at one. It was at, at one. one. At it was one. At I apologize. Oh yeah, and also Rhonda. Not that you're personally responsible for this, but she's an amazing person. I don't. I think she's at one, but her name is um, Michelle Pakansky Brock. In fact. I linked her liquid syllabus idea in my um, agenda. She has been so uh, influential on me and other people I know. And I heard that her <laughs> position might be cut. I mean, really, I was like, no, not Michelle, but can't be Brock. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, well, funding is an issue, right? Everywhere we go. And that's that's the other thing that's really key for um, for Canvas or for like doing, including like online learning or distance ed options. We need funding. Teachers need training and they need constant, like you were saying, right? We're learning, relearning things all the time. It takes, it takes, um, we should be supported like that, right? So I just went to another meeting, but I thank you okay. for your information today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Bye. So I'll so, see you guys. Eleven forty. Did you have something? I see your hand. Yeah. So I just actually I did want to um, I did want to just ask maybe you talked about it again uh, talked about it during the session, but just a quick reminder again: How do you have your PD set up at at CCSF for your instructors to? I mean. Are they going to sort of like a regularly scheduled Canvas training or how are you kind of keeping folks up on their Canvas skills and course building? So first of all, in order to be an official online teacher, you have to take a, a four month, very intensive training, the, the original one. In room two and then afterwards, they have constant workshops and we they, they have a department now that's set up where we have meetings and um, uh, like quick, like like workshops, uh, workshops and yeah, workshops. So, like, so. so it's constant and communication. There's, so there's now a separate department that's only working with those online teachers. And then if they wanna do a second course, we have a second um, level and, and now we're doing poker, which is actually another level. So it's constant um, training. What's the, what is it, um, Kate? What's the department, OLET? Oh, it's, it's OLED, yeah, online, online learning, learning educational educational technology, technology OLED. Yeah. OLED. So we have now a dean and I don't think a, that's a department. I think it is a department. Is a well, it's a department in a sense that we have a chair for that department, which is Fred. We have a dean, we have the VC. So basically it's set up so that it's really focusing on online learning and making sure that we're in compliance and constant training. Right, and there's something called the Faculty Resource Center, which is 
a canvas shell you can add and that has drop-in hours. You can meet one-on-one -on -one with people. They have a video bank that has been created by the ed tech department. Um, they have, um, yeah. Workshops, like workshops. Every, week, every week they'll have workshops on a different feature. Like they meet, you know, they'll, we'll get emails and it's like a voice thread workshop or um, quick, quick checks right the one that I showed exactly and you really have to like it's like anything you want to learn you have to put in the time to learn it it's a lot of hours I'm remembering when I used to go back when I used to go into the teacher's resource room at Ocean and sit at a computer and learn that stuff you had to go in person and for some reason I don't know I went there I don't know why but yeah <laughs> does that answer yeah. your question <laughs> Yeah, Rhonda. So Rhonda mentioned, you know, we at you know C, with CDE and OTAN and um, the state leadership projects, we're trying to figure out ways to um, do a lot of that kind of widespread training and across the state. And so we've started using the Canvas public courses. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the public courses, but basically, it's a way for anybody to join a Canvas course. You don't need a license, right? So that's right. a big. That's a big advantage, but the problem, well, the, shouldn't say problem. The issue with the Canvas courses is, is that it doesn't have the full functionality, right? So even mm -hmm. things like Canvas Studio, for example, you can't use Canvas Studio in a public course. Right. So we're, you know, we're still exploring how to make the most of the public courses because we know a lot of folks are still not connected to Canvas, don't have licenses back at their agent, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so we're trying to kind of thread that, you know, thread that needle to make it as fully functional as possible, but within the limitations of the public course. So, um, but yeah. Where we'll, would someone have access to a public course? You can, you could just um, um, uh, apply and they give you a public course. Well, so you, so you have to have a license yourself, but when right. you go into settings for a course, one of the setting options is to make it public. Um, I can't remember where it is on the settings. It's, it's towards the bottom. Right, and right. You, yeah, you just yeah. like public, and then anybody can view the course materials. They would just Google it and 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 hope you know. Yeah, okay. we can provide a quick link to it or or a Canvas right. link, whatever. And do you guys work with At One? Um, we we know of At One. We don't do a lot of work with them. Um, I think because they're more on the on the community college side, where we're more focused on the K twelve adult ed side. But um, okay. yeah, that's um. Yeah, I mean, we certainly know about them. They've been around for a long time. Some of our trainers have trained with or have been the trainers for App One as well. So we we have sort of a little bit of a link that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you. It was fun for us to do this. <laughs>